the ones that uh, are topical and relevant. So thank you both and I look forward to your presentation. Hello, thank you. Um, one small correction, Dr. Bezran is with the Saskatchewan Health Authority, uh, the province in Saskatchewan. She's a medical information officer. And yes, my name is Kurt Kruger. I'm with Kruger Consulting. Uh, so welcome to the talk. Hopefully it's fruitful. Hopefully it's valuable for everyone here and that there's valuable questions at the end. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, work that we've been conducting essentially since early 2020 uh, when we when news started to emerge about a new um, coronavirus uh, sp spreading around the world. Um, and so the focus of this conversation here will be sort of more about how the modeling has been integrated into the decision making within the health uh, within the health policy, so for health policy decision support. Um, but for those of us who are who want some of the nitty gritty details, we can talk about some of those near the end of the presentation. Um, but our primary focus here is really to advocate for, uh, you know, different types of organizations that work with health behavior. So health decision makers, health bodies, organizations like that, um, to really think about how we can integrate uh, modeling alongside, or maybe even within analytics, uh, you know, the, the analytics arms we already have uh, to really support decision making. And I think that this is really going to be, um, I, I suspect that there's a surging demand for this uh, as we move into the post COVID era. Um, so, with that out of the way, I'm just going to start um, uh, the presentation, and Dr. Bazran will lead us through um, so the first part. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jenny Bazran. I'm an internist geriatrician uh, clinically, and I also spend some of my time as a senior medical information officer for the Saskatchewan Health Authority. So um, unless you've been hiding somewhere, we're all very aware of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it has been challenging for many, many different reasons, certainly from a health system um, point of view and preparing a health system. One of our biggest challenges at the beginning was that this was a brand new virus. We knew nothing about it. Um, we didn't know how it was going to impact um, us here in Saskatchewan. All we saw was very frightening early evidence coming out of China and Italy around the significant impact it was having on individuals, the high death rates, and certainly the, the um, high demand on the healthcare system. So we were tasked to figure out how to plan for this. And as we brought together the various different um, bodies, um, we really recognized all the pieces that were part of the decision making. So understanding um, the demographics, the people uh, that are in the population, the distribution of the population, the risk, uh, the impact of different interventions that we may or may not have evidence on, impact of limitations on PPE was a factor at the beginning, and then the direct impact on health system. How do we get ready? What, what type of services do we need? How much testing do we need? How many beds do we need? All of that. So very complex decision making. And um, next slide, Kurt. And what we know about health system decision making is that typically, traditionally what we've done is we look at each individual part of the system. And it's even further divided in that we take different body parts and we have experts in each of those body parts. And we try to bring them all together. Everybody advocates. They kind of push back and forth to see where the priorities are. And we try to make the best decisions we can. But we know it's a challenge. And um, my first experience, I guess, with modeling was working with Dr. Kruger and Dr. Osgood, who some of you may know. And we were trying to understand system flow. And so when we were preparing for our response for COVID, um, we were fortunate that Dr. Osgood is here in Saskatchewan and we were able to incorporate the modeling team into our digital health analytics team to really think about like, how do we address this? So uh, next slide, Kurt. And so what we did was we said, okay, if we've got all of this information that we need to figure out, lots of unknowns, data from everywhere, you know, how are we going to bring this together? And one of the added benefits and challenges for Saskatchewan was only um, just about a year prior to COVID hitting, Saskatchewan moved from multiple different health regions that all had their own data, own systems in place into one integrated full um, health authority, which covers the majority of the province. So we then had to figure out how do we integrate data from multiple different sources, standardize it, bring it together, and then make some really critical decisions on how to prepare for uh, COVID and, and really truly actionable intelligence. So that was really our goal. And, and, and we were very fortunate to have 
uh, Dr. Osgood and Dr. Kruger available and willing to help. Next slide. So the process rapidly evolved over the last 17 months and Dr. Kruger will cover a little bit more of that. But what was one of our key learnings was that it wasn't enough to just have a model. Um, you know, we had started learning some of that with system flow, but because of the pace with which everything was changing and moving and the rate that decisions needed to be made, we actually realized that to successfully apply modeling to health system decision-making, we actually need five key components and we'll be covering each of these off individually. Not only is there a requirement to understand the process, but an understanding of the availability of the data, what other data is telling us to inform the model and how does information flow out? How do you incorporate evidence that's evolving so quickly? What about the context that this is all happening in? What are the priorities? Do we understand the situation properly? And then most importantly, how do we take the results of the model and share it with others to, to allow them to make the best decisions possible? So next slide. So the first step is really that process map. How, how does COVID evolve? So we learn very quickly around, you know, when do you get infected? How long are you before you're symptomatic? When is your viral load changing so that you become infectious? When is it no longer? What percentage of people become severe that need hospitalization? How long are they going to be there? How many will die? How many will need ICU? And how many will recover? And then even evolving into long COVID. At the same time, we had to think about the flow of patients through the system. How many people are going to need testing? How are we going to manage the testing? What about the lab? What happens in the eMERGE, in the hospital, in the community, in long-term care? So you're trying to connect all of those pieces and making sure that the model represented the specific situation in Saskatchewan. So not only were we looking at uh, you know, Saskatchewan specific length of stay, but also at capacity within each component. And then also because it is an ABM model, how does the province look? Wh which people are where? Where is the distribution of the different populations and geographical risks? And one of the key reasons why we did this is that we did find out when we were working on system flow with the model that Often what we do is we make change in one area to make it look really good. And I always use the Rubik's cube analogy that if you're just focused on fixing one side of the Rubik's cube, you mess up all the other sides. But we do know that there is a way to do a Rubik's cube. I can't do it myself, but many can. Um, that if you do it a certain way, you can actually get all the sides to work. So modeling to us was really um, that opportunity where we could look at how do we um, make different decisions so that we are optimizing all the areas that we can. Next slide. The, th the next component that was really critical was the data. And as the senior medical information officer, um, that was the area that I was leading. And we were really making sure that we combined all our data from the different health authorities uh, to ensure that we had standardized understanding of our bed capacity, the number of patients in the system, but also upstream data around testing, data around the number of positive patients in the system and figuring out how does that um, data not only integrate and standardize, but how does that feed into the model? So having the team integrated in with our team, there was a lot of back and forth to understand what is the best way to have the model inputted into uh, the or the data inputted into the model so that it was really being optimized and fed in really automatically every day. We also used analytics to make sure that we could validate and test different understandings and assumptions within the model. And that understanding um, really helped us uh, understand variations geographically, for, for example. The model was also helpful in allowing us to understand if there's issues with the data. As we were moving very quickly to integrate this data, there was always that risk of something being broken. And so we could generate hypotheses within the model to understand um, where we may be having a data issue so that we could deep dive and figure that out and sort it out. And then finally, when we present the modeling, we often present it along as part of a story along with our analytics. Next slide. The third thing for us was really around, the third component was the evidence. So it was extremely limited at the beginning, but then grew very rapidly. The pace of publications was astounding and the amount of evidence that was coming was very, very fast. We were fortunate in that we had what we call the think tank, a group that we pulled together to really help us take the data, keep on top of it, and then summarize it so that we were able to use it in ways that were helpful inside the model. And so that was a really uh, critical piece of, of the work that we were doing. 
where and then this continued to evolve. It wasn't that, oh, once we figured it out, it was the same. With every new variant that came out, that changed. As the vaccines came out, that changed. As we learned more and more things about specific populations, um, we had to keep updating the model. And the model is quite detailed, right down to um, impact at different age groups of different types of models, of different types of viruses, uh, different variants of the virus. And so a lot of rapidly um, evolving evidence. Where there was uncertainty of, in the evidence, the ABM also played a really important role and that it could run possible scenarios. So at the beginning with the vaccines, we could say, well, if it's 100% effective versus if it's 90% effective, or if the um, vaccine doesn't, if the effectiveness starts waning, what does that mean in our planning? And so we were able to uh, use it in multiple different ways. Next slide. Context is so critical. So not only is it critical in that understanding of the process to understand what are the criteria that you admit patients in. So maybe the literature might say, oh, um, you know, this percentage of patients go to ICU, but we know clinical practice locally, we have a different process in place because we have different options. So understanding context is really critical. But you can see these are all the teams that we actually meet with almost sometimes daily, definitely weekly. And what we do is we work with all these different individual groups, uh, and these are many of the senior decision-making um, uh, bodies, to really understand um, what the priorities are, why are we seeing this big surge in numbers here, what's happening here, and really understand where the limitations are in operational ability. So we're not putting forward scenarios that are not even feasible. And so a lot of back and forth and working in an iterative process with all these various stakeholders has been really, really critical and important for us. It's also really important where the data is missing or fails to provide the whole picture. This is where the qualitative information helps fill in those gaps and make sure that the assumptions in the model are best representative. And I think from a health system modeling point of view, this is one of the unique parts of it is that there is a lot of limitations in the data. So a really good example of that is uh, right now, um, our ICUs are really quite full. And so we have shifted uh, recently some of our clinical practice to take really high severity uh, patients in our observation units. And so you would see this kind of change in the ICU data and it's not fitting the original projections from the model, but, but understanding context, we can account for that and, and incorporate that. Next slide. And then I think, you know, probably one of the biggest learnings for me was really that um, as good as the results are, as amazing as our model was, if we cannot communicate the uh, model, the uncertainty around the model, but also the strengths of the model, if we can't communicate that, then all of this work does not actually lead to actionable change. So we have three levels. We have the stakeholder group that we showed in that previous slide. They're much more familiar. They can see the draft, the outputs that are coming straight out of the model and kind of move very quickly. At the next level are the decision makers at the very top. So our ministers of health, our CEOs, our ELT, those individuals, we need to stylize them a little bit more. And then this graph, it, this one is an example of some stylized uh, results that we did to show to the public, to really get them on board as to why did we have to make this decision? If we do this, why are we still seeing growth? Things like that. And that's really, really critical when we're making really difficult decisions and asking people to um, you know, sacrifice and make difficult changes. So the knowledge translation, very, very critical. Next slide. Now, because we were able to incorporate this process, we'd be able to show the data that was used in the model, very transparent with the evidence. We validated it with broad stakeholders and we adjusted the model quickly to ensure that we were properly capturing a true Saskatchewan scenario. And because of that, I think that's why trust was really built. And as a result of that trust, the role of modeling became quite significant and continues to be quite significant in the system preparedness that we have for COVID in Saskatchewan. As part of our presentation, when we present our modeling results, which we're now doing um, uh, multiple times a week, uh, we present it as a package. So we show the analytics with the current state understanding of the system. We show evidence, current state evidence, and then we show the modeling as well as uh, the actuals to see how well the model is tracking. And that's really um, led to a lot of success in Saskatchewan. Next slide. And I think this is the last slide for me. And I think where um, it all ended up is we really wanted to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And we call this the Steposaurus. So um, 
how they built our system readiness plan was really based on the longer term projection. So um, as looking at what would be the peak, what could be the worst that we would have to plan for, but knowing that because we were showing shorter term projections and those shorter term projections were really quickly validated, they really did trust us. And so they said, okay, because we trust the modeling and the outputs from the model, we know we have to have enough beds to maybe potentially get to this, but we're not gonna activate all of those. We're gonna take a stepwise approach because with the short-term projections, we have enough time to activate the next step, but we're not gonna cancel all these surgeries until we really need to. We're not gonna you know, shift all this stuff around until we really need to. And really we can see what will be the impact. So we'll hold off because we see that the modeling is telling us that this intervention is gonna have this type of impact within the next two to three weeks. So we'll adjust our services accordingly. And I think that really accelerated the trust. We've been quite successful um, with that. And we get a tremendous number of demands for modeling scenarios as a result. So off to you, Kurt. Great. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the modeling history. So um, as maybe maybe we can tell from, from the process that that, we, that Jenny, uh, Dr. Bazran was just sharing, it's a quite integrated process. Um, and so um, essentially what started happening in the beginning of 2020 is uh, Dr. Osgood at the University of Saskatchewan some, and some of his core students, um, they started um, th essentially three parallel lines of action to try to get, to try to get some modeling around. And, and these three parallel lines of action have all fed into the work that we've been doing with the, with the health ministry, the Saskatchewan Health Authority. So the first main line of action, which was really to generate a model, a system dynamics model, that could help us make quick, as quick as possible, some projections from the model to make us, uh, to give us some insight as to what may happen in Saskatchewan. Um, are we going to be on the same trajectory as in Italy or as a China or something uh, less severe? To really ask questions about what kind of contact tracing we should be scaling up to, what's going to be our initial demand on the hospital system, to really get a, a, a broad but initial scope. And as anyone in the modeling community knows, like system dynamics um, is a really nice approach to be able to build those models relatively quickly. Um, the second sort of major line that was that was developed was an integration between system dynamics and a machine learning approach called the particle filter. Um, so I'm not going to talk uh, much about this model because that was developed by other people, but that was another part of this overall modeling process. The basic idea of the particle filter system dynamics model. Um, that's kind of represented here, is uh, that you have a system dynamics model that's automatically reground as you get data fed in from, in this case, our public health partners, so the daily cases and admissions and tests and so on. So this system dynamics model is really helpful for a couple main reasons. One of them is that it gives us an automatically updated short-term projection. So what's going to happen in the next one or two weeks? And as data starts to shift, the projections from the model begin to shift as well, kind of automatically. And the second main, uh, you know, the second useful contribution of this modeling approach as we used it was to give us estimations for latent characteristics of our system. So this would be things like the, um, the effective reproductive number, um, which is a, a tool that's, that was especially useful early on, but still useful for determining the trajectory of our, um, our cases. Uh, and then, you know, like the number of, um, the number of undiagnosed infectives that are sort of walking around the province. And then the third line of modeling that was started early on uh, was an agent-based model. And so this was initially developed by an, another student from Dr. Osgood's lab. Um, and this is an agent-based model that we knew was, was, gonna be, was going to be important to capture some of this nuanced policy intervention. So the agent-based model was initially built to look at kind of the medium and the long-term um, horizon to help us ask questions around policies uh, to see how they may, uh, you know, affect each other in the long term, how they may collaborate with each other, uh, how they may interfere with each other, and so on. Um, so that's what's represented here. It's a GIS model, uh, and it has discrete event simulation for service delivery and for testing and contact tracing. And then it has an agent-based pop population represented in this GIS environment. Um, so I'll just... Uh, show that a little bit now. So this is a screenshot of the model on the left uh, as it as it um, as it describes the city of Saskatoon, which is the largest city in the province. Um, so this is just to show that the model has been used at different levels of um, different levels of scope. So the model is currently being used at a provincial level, 
So there's 1.2 million people in the province. So there's 1.2 million agents in the model. And it's also been used in the past at the local level, uh, sort of the small communities where certain early on in the pandemic, we had local outbreaks. So we wanted to study those. So the model has been used a wide, range, a, a wide array of places to help answer a wide array of questions. Um, and so the model as it currently stands, uh, this is a visualization of it. I'll just get this visualization started. Um, due to the size of the model, given that you know we have 1.2 million agents and we have, um, you can see in the map on the top right, that's another of the major cities in Saskatoon. We have um, hospitals and schools, we have uh, contact tracing, we, uh, you'll see it zoom out in a moment here to look at the entire province. So we have all communities across the province. So we're representing that geographic diversity. So this model um, takes a lot to run it. So for a single realization of the model, it might take 20 or 30 gigs of RAM, and it might take 60 or 90 minutes to run, depending on how long we run it. Um, so this is just a sped up version. So the visualization of the model runtime itself was really not what was the most important thing for when looking at the population level modeling. Um, so really what the model does is it generates the number of statistics, um, things that we care about, let's say the, the number of tests per day or the number of new admissions or the number of cases in long-term care facilities or the number of vaccinations of dose one, two, or three by area. So a wider range of different types of statistics uh, that the model generates. So every time we run the model, we generate essentially one hypothesis. And obviously because it's a stochastic model, we have to, we have to run it multiple times. Um, but this is sort of how the model looks. And then you know, we, we send it off to our own servers uh, to run many iterations and scenarios and replications across all of those runs. So this is our final slide and I'll let uh, Jenny take over. Yeah, so I think um, one of our key messages is that the, there's so much power in these models, but for it to be truly successful, it needs to be incorporated into the decision-making process. I think that's really where um, the outputs of all the, the complex work that, that modeling does can actually result in, um, in changes in actions taken and decisions. And so um, it is an iterative process. Data is always evolving, evidence is changing, priorities change. And the key by working together is to you know, be transparent with what's in the model, but also to build trust through this collaborative, collaborative relationship. It then allows stakeholders to understand that uncertainty you know, it's always ironic at the beginning, you know, there were some challenges with people understanding the modeling and I had to reinforce to them, like, how did we make decisions in the past? We had no real way of understanding what would happen, which made the most difference and things like that. And so um, I think now with the COVID, which was a, you know, very rapid, very quick decision-making, we have now built that trust and uh, we are using it for short-term and long-term planning. And our goal really is to incorporate uh, modeling into our analytics past COVID. There's so many uses that we can see in this, um, but we do recognize that there is a uh, shortage of health system modelers. Um, and so we, we are hoping that we can create this ecosystem where you know people training and learning can also work with us and, and, it, and we can learn from each other. So back to you, Kurt. Uh, no, I don't have anything else to add, except uh, I know we didn't spend too much time talking about the model, so I'd be happy to answer some of those questions. But um, again, you can see from our from our presentation that there were multiple models involved. And so, um, yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, open for questions. Uh, Jenny, do you want to take that question? Yeah, that that's a great question, um, Andrew. Um, Definitely the model, um, the kind of frequent updates are mostly internal. We do, this is a partnership with our Ministry of Health as well as the Health Authority. And so there are certain times at the beginning, uh, we were showing the modeling to really help the uh, local population of Saskatchewan understand why significant measures had to be taken. And the graph that I showed you earlier was um, another example of us showing uh, different scenarios to help the ministry and the chief medical health officer explain why certain uh, public health orders were being put into place. So it's not um, every time, um, you know, the the weekly rapid one is really around capacity planning and knowing what services we're going to shift and to build, you know, additional ICU capacity or what are we going to do with the lab and things like that. But there are times where um, it will get shared at a, a more public level as well.
Any other questions? Do you have any comments on the insight versus specific, specificity versus performance of agent versus system dynamics approaches? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, honestly, this is one of the reasons why um, we use AnyLogic so much because it allows us to switch back and forth between these approaches. So even within the agent-based approach, it's a hybrid really of agent-based and discrete event. Um, but yeah, so the, the agent-based model was really like the primary value of, of the agent-based model is to allow us to ask this kind of preventive question. So like, what's the situation gonna be like in two or three months? Um, but more like, what's the situation if our vaccination is at this level of protection or if there's this level of waning or so on? And we have to, we communicate this a lot because this type of model really depends on our assumptions around human behavior. Um, so the data that we were reading in was not, let's say, momentary uh, location data for people in the population. Although if it did have that, maybe the model could be um, more usefully represented. But we were making assumptions that essentially people's behavior stays the same into the future. But obviously, as soon as you make a projection and talk about an intervention, then the, then the outcome changes. So the, the utility of the agent-based model was really to allow us to do some scenario planning, to check the robustness of our system, to really figure out if, uh, if we're entering a, a, an area that's a danger, or we're at risk of reaching any kind of limits. And the value of something like a system dynamics model um, or maybe more appropriately, a hybrid between system dynamics and something like a particle filter or a more data-driven analytical method in combination with the system dynamics model is to tell us what's the conditions on the ground right now, what's taking place now, and where might we be in one to two weeks' time. Um, so the agent-based models take a lot more effort to build, and they take a lot more effort to run. So we have to be a little bit more cautious about the scenarios to run, but the system dynamics models uh, are much faster at that. The downside to them, obviously, is they can't capture some of those heterogeneities that we know are going to be really important in the future. So there's always a benefit, a cost benefit, between switching between the two. I see a question here about, uh, I, I think that, is that the Alberta or is that the agent-based? <laughs> the agent-based based and hybrid models perform poorly. I, I can speak for oh. just ours in that, um, I would say, you know, even with expecting a degree of uncertainty, we've been eerily quite accurate with our model. Um, very, very accurate. And I think part of that is uh, the excellent model that uh, Dr. Kruger and team have built. But I think also because we've wrapped it around with those five components, we're always updating it with the evidence. There's data with who's been vaccinated, who's in hospital, all of that's being fed every day into the model. So it's getting the, the much more data than even what is publicly released data. And I think, um, you know, we are getting a really good understanding of behaviors because we are meeting with uh, ministry, or sorry, the um, the uh, the different representation from the different areas. So I think we have a really good understanding of that, but I don't know if you wanna add to that, Kurt. Uh, I'll just add one thing. Uh, we haven't actually, none of these models are ABM uh, SD hybrids. So we have an ABM and then a separate model is an SD. Um, and so we haven't done any ABM SD hybrids, so there's nothing to stop us from doing so. But yeah, we do need to take into account a little bit just of how the math works. I know AnyLogic has done some work to make that function more efficiently. Um, so yeah, on that, on that modeling question, we haven't done a whole lot of ABM SD hybrids. But uh, I guess the last question from Eris was, I think that was just addressed by Dr. Bazran. The validation process for a health model really involves a lot more than a data-driven comparison with the real world, given that in any situation where there's health behavior, um, the data that we have is so much uh, smaller than the complexity of the system. Um, so we really have to rely on methods beyond just the traditional validation approaches to be able to get that trust developed. And I think where our models, at, you know, at the beginning when they weren't matching, we would go back to figure out why, right? Was it an assumption, was it a data issue, was it an evidence issue? And so we, it's continuous kind of quality improvement um, to really get the accuracy that we're getting. I'm sure we could talk for a lot more than the 30 <laughs> seconds we have left. Um, so if anyone wants to reach out to us um, offline, we'd be happy to talk more. Thank you. And remember, you can do that uh, by clicking their profiles here on the conference website. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. And thank you even more for the work you're doing. Um, it's benefiting, benefiting us all. So much appreciated.
Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Sudendu Raye, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, from AIG. Um, he will be talking about 